Okay guys, this is Miss Sinclair from University High School AP World History Modern. We are continuing our Unit 7 lectures and in our last episode, video, audio recording, I don't know, lecture, whatever, uh, we were talking about the Russian Revolution. Um, and here's a tricky thing about chronology for this time period. The Russian Revolution happens in the midst of all this chaos. So if it seems like I stopped talking about the war to briefly talk about the revolution and now I'm going back to the war, it's because all of these things were happening simultaneously. So today we are going to talk about the aftermath of World War I and how it actually all ended up. So for your bell work for today, sorry about that you should be able to identify what were the causes of the Russian Revolution. Again, you don't have to do any of these things, but I always recommend you pause and use this as a self-check. Can I identify the causes of the Russian Revolution or do I have to look in my notes for that again? So notes today, end of World War One. Our AP objective is um, you'll be able to identify and explain the causes of the Russian Revolution. Also thinking about what were the end results of um, World War I. How did governments act in response to all of this? So, the end of the war. Here's the thing. After Russian withdraws in 1917, Germany figures, we're going to win. This is easy peasy. We will transfer all of our soldiers to the Western Front, and finally, we will be able to beat this stalemate, right? The trenches never moved more than four miles on the Western Front. Victory seemed so near. They could taste it. But then the Americans arrive, and they're fresh, and they are enthusiastic, and they are well-fed, and they are ready to fight. And Germany is exhausted, mounting casualties, fatigue, a lack of resources, a lack of food, ammunition, just willpower to invest in all of this. So, Austro-Hungarian Empire surrenders. German commanders agree to an armistice, an end of fighting on November 11th, 1918. So, that's why it's Veterans Day, right? Veterans Day marks the end of World War I. World War I claims 15 million lives and wounds 20 million. It's an entire generation of European men nearly wiped out completely. The bombs and troops destroyed towns, cities, farms. This is going to have a huge impact on Europe, not only economically, but just psychologically. You'll see this in their art, in the modernist art movements, in literature, in, think about Ernest Hemingway, um, this idea of cynicism like what was it all for we all died we all were scarred and for what it's gonna have a huge impact on the formation of sort of the 20th century mindset so peace treaties three um the impact of the war was enormous we see that the 20 million who return wounded are shell-shocked, they have experienced poison gases, they are missing limbs. These are not things that you can just recover from quickly. The war forced over 3 million Russians, Germans, and Hungarians to flee as refugees. So thinking about the movement of disease, culture, the impact um, on the receiving cities. Spanish flu kills 5% of the global population. It moves in three waves. Um, and no one quite knows where it originates. Um, theory number one, Kansas. Theory number two, a hospital in Russia. Theory number three, I can't remember. Most people think it's probably the Kansas theory from an um, army barrack in Kansas. But here's the thing. It doesn't matter. You had so much movement of people, um, soldiers who, for the first time, are traveling more than 12 miles beyond their farm, right? They're traveling across countries, across oceans, Workers, think about all the workers who went from China to the Americas. And the reason why it's called the Spanish flu 
is because Spain was neutral and thus did not have the same censorship of the press, right? In all of our countries at war, they were very drastically censoring the press and they didn't tell about the Spanish flu because they didn't want people to get more discouraged. Spain, not war, not censoring the press, talking about it entirely. So everyone's like, oh, it comes from Spain, Spanish flu. Well, really, we don't know where it came from, but the war certainly exacerbated it. Plus, we have enormous damage to the natural environment. It destroys towns, forests. It takes decades to clear the debris. And if you travel through Europe now, you'll still see the scars. So as we start thinking about peace, three men are going to dominate the Paris Peace Conference. Woodrow Wilson, President of the United States, Prime Minister David Lloyd George, and um, French Premier... Um, Georges uh, Clemenceau. And essentially what they're going to do is they're going to ignore the Italians. They're going to ignore the Japanese request that everyone is treated equally, that all races are treated equally. They'll ignore the Pan-African Congress. Everyone knows they're meeting here, so all of these representatives and delegates from different groups show up to lobby their cause. Um, Prince Faisal of Iraq, um, the Zionist leaders, Armenian delegations, um, colonists. And yet we'll see that one of the things that we talk about coming out of this, and one of the things that you should 100% know for AP World History, AP Euro, A Push, this is a big point for the end of World War I, is Woodrow Wilson's 14 points speech. He's the U.S. president and one of the leading figures at this conference. He's an idealist. He is a progressive, but um, a Democrat. He wins um, his election in the United States primarily because Teddy Roosevelt splits the votes of the Republicans. He is a Princeton professor. I think it might be a different Ivy League, but I'm, I'm willing to bet money that's Princeton. He's an intellectual and He's an optimist, right? He has this view for the future, his 14 points, to make sure we never have a war like this again. David Lloyd George and Georges Clemenceau are much more self-serving. They want to punish Germany. And all of these points of view make total sense if you consider where they're coming from. Woodrow Wilson hasn't been at war for four years. Woodrow Wilson hasn't lost millions of men. They haven't broken, uh, he hasn't spent millions of dollars trying to create an economy. He, he hasn't lost the way France and Britain have lost. He hasn't been in pain the way their countries have. So it makes sense. He can come in and say like, hey guys, let bygones be bygones. Let's all just get along. And whereas Britain and France are like, no, we're mad. We're hurt. And we want to see someone punished. So here are nine of his 14 points. They're big ones. Um, the ones you should definitely know. Um, so free trade for everyone. These are his post-war goals. A diplomatic end to war. So rather than, you know, blowing each other up, first have diplomats get together see if we can talk through a solution. Then international disarmament to the lowest point consistent with domestic safety. Basically, this means everyone gives up most of their weapons, right? All you should really need is basically the Coast Guard. What do you need to help out your people in event of a disaster? Withdrawal of the central powers from occupied territories. The creation of an independent Poland. This is upsetting for both Germany and Russia. The Poles are pretty happy though. Territorial restructuring along ethnic lines. So nationalism, right? So what do you do with all of that territory that Austria-Hungary had? Well, break it up into smaller countries based on ethnicity. A creation of a League of Nations. This is like a precursor to the UN. It's designed to be an international, supranational organization where countries can come together to talk out problems and address concerns. 
the return of the Alsace Lorraine to France, and then self-determination, the right of people in a region to determine whether they want to be independent or not. His 14 points plan will be the basis of the terms for German surrender. And it raised expectations in non-European countries for freedom from colonial domination. Wilson wins the 1919 Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts here. So they meet in Paris to create the deal. The outcome is going to be what's known as the Treaty of Versailles, 1919, because there's like a million Treaty of Versailles. Austria-Hungary is dissolved into Austria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia. The Ottoman Empire is reduced to present-day Turkey. Great Britain will control Iraq and Pakistan, and France will control Syria and Lebanon. Russia will lose territory in the forms of Poland and Romania, and Finland, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania all receive independence from Russia, right? So the Baltic states. All of the wartime promises of independence uh, to colonial leaders in return for their war support are forgotten, right? So all of these colonial possessions were like, sure, Europe will help you with your stupid war if you'll give us independence. And after the war, Europe's like, mm, no, I don't remember making those promises. This is a pretty good um, video. Um, it's about the Paris Peace Conference and the way that the Entente, these Western powers, completely snub Japanese support and um, input right? Japan had helped the um, Entente, right? They had um, provided weapons, um, military support, like they had, they had participated. And all they were asking for is like, hey, can you recognize that we are on the same level as you guys? That we as Asians are not inferior to you as Europeans? And the Europeans are like, nope, we can't do that. And it pisses them off. So the Treaty of Versailles, 1919, it is a treaty imposed on Germany by Great Britain, France, and the United States. Germany is given no part in drafting this agreement. Here's the thing. Britain and France want to punish someone, but who's left to punish? The Ottomans and the Austrian-Hungarians are gone. Those countries no longer exist so who do you have left? Germany. It wasn't Germany's fault. We talked about that with the start of the war. It just kind of happened. So the goal of Britain and France is to cripple Germany economically so it can, no, so it can never again rise up to power and threaten to invade other European states. Yeah, we know how all that works out. There was disagreements about how to deal with Germany. Wilson was not a favor of this blame German approach, but he was outvoted. So the outcome for Germany is Article 223, which is a clause that places total blame, 100% of the blame on Germany as the aggressor. It's known as the guilt clause. And it's going to create a lot of shame and feeling and anger in Germany, right? These aren't creating... Uh, a sense of reconciliation between European states, it's going to piss Germans off because they're like, it wasn't our fault. We didn't assassinate Franz Ferdinand. It was, if it wasn't for Russia, then this really wouldn't be an, a war to begin with. And France and Britain played just a big part in forming it. And yet we're the ones who started World War One. Yeah, okay. It limits the German army to 100,000 soldiers and no air force. They have to give back the Alsace Lorraine, which had been given, sorry, had been won by Germany in the Franco Prussian War. They have to give up some territory to Poland as well. They have to pay billions in reparations. So, reparations are, gosh, what's the best way to describe it? Imagine I um, drove my car into your house. I would have to pay for the damages, right? The loss of your um, property um, that might have been destroyed, the cost of repairing it, right? So all of those would be reparations. And Germany lost all of their colonies, Tanzania, Rwanda, Cameroon, and Samoa. 
other things coming out of the um, Treaty of Versailles will be the League of Nations, but we'll talk about that in a moment. So here is the map after the um, end of World War One. So you can see the creation of all of these new states. Obviously, Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic, and Slovakia, Yugoslavia, Slovenia, um, Croatia, Bosnia, um, Serbia, all that jazz. And then the Soviet Union. So one of the things that the AP will ask you to do in the multiple choice parts, but then also on DBQs and SAQs, is they'll give you images, they'll give you political cartoons, and you will be expected to be able to pull out the pertinent information. So I would suggest that you pause this video and you quickly, before I tell you the information, you analyze this political cartoon and see if you can identify who the different figures are, um, what's the message of this cartoon, who do you think is creating it, What's the purpose? Who's the audience? What's the context? So you can see here in the um, image, the big four pills worth a mil worth millions a box. So here's Woodrow Wilson. Um, here is David Lloyd George. Here's Clemenceau. And this is going to be um, the premier of Italy. He's not really as relevant as he likes to think he is. Um, peace terms, you've got to swallow it like you like it or not. The British Empire, France, America, Italy, Japan, you can see they're holding um, Germany in place. So it shows that regardless of what Germany wants, they will have to do what these Western powers want. All right, so the League of Nations. The League of Nations is this international community, right? It's an international organization designed to promote world peace and cooperation. So you can see the founding members are here in dark blue. Um, the gray countries never joined. Teal here are colonies and people who came and left. So here's the thing about the League of Nations. Oh gosh. It's Woodrow Wilson's brainchild, right? The goal is to establish and preserve peace and humanitarian goals. Many nations refuse to join it. England and France are hesitant. Germany and Russia just simply aren't allowed. And here's the thing. He finally, Woodrow Wilson, finally goes around. He's convincing everyone. He's like, it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. We'll do all these things you want. Just, just join my League of Nations. Right? This is the number one thing that he cares about. And everyone's like, fine, we'll join. And then he goes back home and is like, guys, I have solved the problem um, of war. We'll never have war again. Now we will have world peace. All you have to do is join this group. And the U.S. goes, mm, no, we're not doing that. We don't like that we got involved in the international war to begin with. And this seems like it would draw us into more conflicts. Congress refuses. So even though it's Woodrow Wilson's idea, the United States never joins. And in fact, Woodrow Wilson's going to go around um, pleading his case, trying to rally support, and it's going to break his health. He'll eventually have a stroke. And sort of the failure of the League of Nations and his attempts to push it through are some of the things historians account for that. Wilson's idealism clashed with the post-war realities in both the victorious and the defeated states. League of Nations is a precursor to the UN, and it was effective in doing things like providing famine relief and dealing with refugees, but otherwise was totally weak, did not prevent any war. But this is really where you see the United States starting to exert itself as a strong military, political, and economic leader in Western Europe. So, pause and ask yourself, how did Woodrow Wilson's points influence the terms of the Treaty of Versailles? And what were the possible results of the treaty's treatment of Germany? Okay, let's return to Russia briefly. So, Lenin's one control, right? They kill the Tsar's family. It's 
he's now um, getting rid of the provisional government. It's communist Russia, right? Wrong. First, you have a civil war. Three years of burning crops, confiscating materials, destroying farms. You have a civil war between the communists, the Bolsheviks, also known as the Red Army, and the counter-revolutionaries, also known as the White Army. Now, the, really, the only thing that the whites had in common with each other is that they hated the Reds. Right, so here's the problem. They didn't have a cohesive goal or method or plan what would happen if they won, right? They were united simply by their hatred of the Bolsheviks, but in the end, the different components of the whites had different goals for Russia. But you can see it sort of represents tradition, right? There's the church, um, there's the old flag, um, aristocrats. So in the end... The Bolsheviks win. You have um, the civil war causes famine and the spread of disease. It kills 10 million, more than who died in World War I. And with this, um, you're going to have the formation of the USSR. This is a great TED Talk. I really recommend you look at it. It's History versus Lenin. It's a TED Ed. And it looks at historiography. How should we interpret Lenin's legacy, right? So um, Vladimir Lenin is a complex historical figure. Um, and history is simply interpretation. There are ways to look at him and paint him 100% as the villain. But there's also ways to look at him and be really sympathetic to his cause. He had some good goals, right? And Russia's old system wasn't exactly perfect. So, formation of the USSR, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Now, remember, a Soviet was a council. So, now they're officially a communist state. That's their economic policy with an authoritarian ruler as their political policy. Remember, because communism relies on government control of resources, Communist countries always utilize authoritarian rulers who can manage that extreme level of control. Moscow becomes the new capital. The goal here is creating distance from the Romanov past. Remember the old capital of St. Petersburg slash Petrograd, which will eventually become Leningrad. In 19, um, 19, um, Lenin creates the Comintern, which is a formal group of Bolsheviks who encouraged communism elsewhere. So what was life like in Lenin's Russia? Well, his initial plans are to redistribute all of the land to peasants and have the state take over basic industries, right? It, this actually, so war communism is what's called, leads to agricultural and industrial decline. Russia's post-war economy is simply not ready for 100% socialism. The economy is a mess. So he rolls out his new economic policy. It is a policy proposed by Lenin to encourage the revival of the Soviet economy by allowing for small private enterprises. It's a mixture of communism and capitalism, right? So the overarching economic policy is still communism, but the first form of it was war communism. Now you have the new economic policy, which is like communism light. He allows for small amounts of private land ownership and small businesses to flourish while the state still set basic economic policies. He loosens trade restrictions. He encourages relations with the West. The result is an increase in food production. Now, it's important to understand this reflected no change in the ultimate goals of the Communist Party, but it was designed to give some breathing space to the nation's economy as it makes this transition. So here's how it would be different, right? Under war communism, a peasant would grow 10 tons of wheat. The government would take nine tons of it leaving the peasant with one ton of wheat to use as seed for the following year, food for their family, sale, etc. With the new economic policy, you grow 10 tons of wheat, the government only takes 
leaving the peasant with five tons so they can sell it, keep some, use it, right? It gives you more options. Here's the problem. He rolls out his plan in 1923 and dies of a stroke in 1924. The result is a power struggle. So Leon Trotsky, one of Lenin's allies and commander of the Red Army, you can see him here with the glasses, he had the support of the old Bolsheviks, people who joined the party before the revolution. He spent years in exile as well. He believed this would spark a world revolution of the working class. Versus Joseph Stalin, the general secretary of the Communist Party. He's never lived outside of Russia. He believed socialism can really only survive in one country. And he filled the party bureaucracy with people loyal to him. We know who wins. It's Stalin. He has Trotsky expelled and forced to flee, and eventually he sends someone after him to have him assassinated. Ice pick to the head. We'll spend a lot more time talking about Joe Stalin and his oppression in Russia. But he is the leader after Lenin. So now what? Right? Now what? We have a world supposedly at peace, and yet there are ramifications, right? It was a pointless war, and cynicism's going to grow. The traditional ideas of war's nobility and heroism collapse, right? No one's looking at these soldiers and being like, oh, man, like I want to be like you when I grow up. No. Who wants to be like the veteran sitting on the corner of the street who's missing half his face because of mustard gas and a leg because of shrapnel? No, war is only destruction. The op optimism of France's La Belle Epoque has ended and art, cinema, poems, literature all respond. You can see it in modernism, you can modern art. You can see it in the writings of men like Ernest Hemingway, um, F. Scott Fitzgerald, think about um, sort of, um, oh gosh, this, this whole lost generation, right? They, they've lost their will in some ways. They've lost their, their guidance. You can look at German expressionism in art and film. In many ways, this is called a writer's war because soldiers wrote letters to loved ones. They wrote poems from the trenches. The spread of liberal reforms, a.k.a. education, meant that most soldiers and the public were literate by the 20th century. So soldiers' experiences are really preserved. The, the term lost generation is popularized by Ernest Hemingway. It describes a generation whose stability and cultural ideas have been wiped away. Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises captures a variety of losses in the war, specifically masculinity. And we see this shift away from romanticism to modernism in art. What about imperialism, right? That was kind of like the watchword for um, the last unit, right? Well, to win the support of colonies, Europeans made promises reg regarding the post-war period. Primarily, they were promised independence. This created a lot of strain when it didn't happen. Right? The war cast doubt on this whole idea of white racial supremacy. Really? Really? You guys are the best? You guys are better than us? You just ripped each other to pieces for no good reason. The war is going to give support to anti-colonial movements and colonies. And they are often led by charismatic, Western-educated elites who supported nationalism. Right? Think about Gandhi. Leaders often rallied peasants and the urban masses and often relied on nonviolent forms of protest. So the 1920s end up as a decade of dissatisfaction among people whose hopes had been raised by the rhetoric of war and dashed by its outcomes. In 1923, the French occupation of the Ruhr, R U H R, and severe inflation will bring Germany to the brink of civil war. Germany's government at this time is known as the Wehrmacht Republic and it's not going to be very successful. 
Fiscal reform, the creation of an American-led system to facilitate payment of war debts, and the French withdrawal from the war is going to mark the beginning of a period of peace and economic growth beginning in 1924. Okay, so this is going to be the end of our sort of World War I lectures. So I would like you to be able to identify and explain how World War I led to the Russian Revolution, and then identify and explain one condition of the Treaty of Versailles. I would recommend with that you included a impact on the treaty or a potential impact on the treaty on colonies, Germany, ex culture, ex et cetera, et cetera. Okay, as always, you can find a lot of supplemental videos on the YouTube page under Unit 7. There's also a whole World War I playlist. Um, we're going to start talking about what's happening in Asia then the Great Depression, and then fascism. Thanks, guys.